Hey everyone, welcome back to the latest edition of the show. Uh, today I'm going to give a talk on Homer's Odyssey and the role of the world axis, also known as the axis mundi, uh, as proposed by the religious historian Mircea Eliade. If you are unfamiliar with the story, I suggest you go read it, um, or this presentation may not make much sense. If you were not partial to reading, uh, there's a great audiobook of the Odyssey done by Ian McKellen, um, and I highly recommend it. I'll be reading some passages in ancient Greek, so you'll have to forgive me if I accidentally mess up the meter or the stress or the pronunciation. I'll give a translation of the short Greek excerpts afterwards, so you can follow along regardless of your level of Greek. All right, so let's get started. A key interest in the study of myth for the great Romanian historian Mircea Eliade was the close consideration to the symbolism of space and spatial orientation. Perhaps the clearest manifestation of this interest was in his writings on the symbolism of the quote unquote center, a motif of the navel of the world, the main stay of heaven, or the axis mundi, a term which he himself coined, albeit a concept he did not invent. In this relatively brief talk today, I'd like to explore the text of Homer's Odyssey in light of these motifs which Eliade brought to popular attention. Now, I don't want to suggest that the one who wrote down the text of the Odyssey was himself or herself making a conscious use of this specifically Eliadian axis mundi. Uh, obviously, this would be to commit the crime of projecting a very modern ideological construct onto the past. Instead, I want to show how the explanations given by Eliade for his conception of sacred space functions rather well as an exegetical model which can be applied quite naturally onto a number of episodes in the Odyssey. We'll see how some of these episodes explicitly reveal the Iron Age poet's understanding of the world axis as a pivotal mythological concept. As we'll see, individual instances of so-called axis mundorum throughout the text serve to juxtapose multiple worlds that each revolve around their own central pillar. Most notably, there are pillars central to the events in Utopian Phaeka, and pillars central to the events in Odysseus' homeland Ithaca. So, let's first turn to the conception of sacred space as described by Mircea Iliade, so that we can later apply it to specific episodes in the Odyssey. Iliad proposed that inherent to all myth and ritual is what he called a distinct boundary situation. He explained that a boundary situation arises when a character, quote, discovers himself becoming conscious of his place in the universe. Let me say that again. It's a place where a character discovers himself becoming conscious of his place in the universe. That is, when he's in a place of self-revelation. This process of self-revelation, wherever it may occur, inevitably leads to one's awareness of the clear dichotomy between sacred space on the one hand and profane space on the other. Sacred space acts as a sort of microcosm to the external world. Uh, it is consciously delineated, it's set apart, and it's orderly. But outside of sacred space, there's a contrary world characterized by formlessness, chaos, and danger. So, in this cosmology, the world can be conceived as being made up of concentric circles, at the center of which lies sacred space, which is surrounded or engulfed by a profane circle. Building on this, Iliad conceived that at the heart of every sacred space is a center, uh, more sacred than any other space, 
because it manifests sacredness itself in the form of revelation, epiphany, or hierophany. Eliade felt that this conception of the world was not only inherent to all mankind, but also fundamentally necessary to human society. Every society, he believed, inevitably exhibits this understanding of a ritually delineated center for encounter with the sacred, whether consciously or unconsciously. It's just a simple consequence of living in three-dimensional space while holding on to the notion that some people, places, and things are sacred, while others are not. So, these centers can be expressed in a number of different forms. They're most often manifest in cultic objects or abstract symbols, such as a world tree or pillars which hold up the heavens. Uh, both of which appear explicitly as symbols in the Odyssey. Eliade conceived that the power of these centers is derived from the fact that they exist as a point of intersection between the celestial world, in our case Olympus, and the underworld, uh, Hades, and the third world, which is the material world, the world of men. It's in these centers where so-called ruptures of plane might occur. This is when communication is thought to pass between the three separate realms. The conduit for this communication, according to Eliade, occurs through the motif of the axis mundi, the world axis, which at once connects and supports heaven and earth, and whose base is fixed in the world below. It's from this universal pillar at the center of the world from which the entire world extends. If we think of it this way, all other centers are merely imitations, eternally repeating the same archaic image. The cosmic mountain, the world tree, or the central pillar which sustains the planes of the cosmos. In light of this, Eliade reasonably suppose that there may exist a multiplicity of centers and that these centers always possess a transferable nature. So let's see now how Eliade's notions might apply to the world axes found throughout the Odyssey, though predominantly focusing our attention on those pillars, navels, and world trees found in Book 1, the Phaeacian episode, and the episode of Odysseus's return to Ithaca. The specific words we're looking for in Greek are kion and stathmos, both of which are used interchangeably to mean roof pillar or column throughout the Odyssey. In addition to these instances, we'll look at the episodes in Book 6, wherein Odysseus compares the royal maiden Nausicaa uh, whom he believes might be a goddess, to a palm tree, which he once saw growing next to an Apollonian altar on Delos. So, our very first appearance of the pillar motif in the Odyssey is a great example to demonstrate how Iron Age Greeks not only associated the word kion with the concept of a world axis, but also simultaneously held to the concept of a world navel. Ne so en amphiorite hoti tom phalosis ti talases, ne so stendre satea tento matanae atlantos tugeter olo fronos hoste talases, passe bente aiden e ke de te ki on asautos, macras agai ante kai uranon amphisecusi. That's from Book 1, line 50 to 54. On a sea-girt island where stands the navel of the sea, on this forested island a goddess makes her home, the daughter of malign Atlas, who knows the depths of every sea and by himself holds the tall pillars that hold apart heaven and earth. So, here... Not only is the notion of a maritime center expressed with the word omphalos, 
but so too is the axis mundi motif expressed in its most elementary form. We are told that earth and heaven are held apart by the pillars, by the kionas, of Atlas himself. We see the transferable nature of the world's center here, and the potential for the multiplicity of centers arising in one single narrative. I think the main idea I'm trying to get across here is that the center of the world is not a fixed location, but it's rather subject to move depending on the focal point of the narrative. So passing through to our second instance of the world axis motif, we come to the island of Scaria, where Nausithus had led the Phaeacians to settle down uh, away from the Cyclops. By this point, Odysseus had been battered about by the sea and wandering for twenty days, having escaped captivity from Calypso on Ogygia, at the aforementioned Naval of the Sea. Then. After he's unconsciously washed up onto the shore, Odysseus wakes up to the sound of young girls playing ball. Naked and encrusted with sea brine, Odysseus walks to a nearby thicket to get a leafy branch with which to cover his nudity. Here he's spotted by Nausicaa, the daughter of the Phaeacian king Alcinous, and Odysseus is unsure whether he should address the girl at a distance or fall before her knees and beg for help. At this point, Odysseus is caught in a fatal dilemma. He's uncertain whether he's stumbled upon a bathing goddess or just a young girl of exceeding beauty. Odysseus asks her, Are you god or mortal? If you are a god who holds wide heaven, I think you nearest to Artemis, great Zeus's daughter, in figure, form, and stature. This moment of doubt is offset, however, when Nausicaa's appearance elicits a vivid memory in Odysseus's mind while he stands locked in amazement. De lo de pote toion apollon os parabo mo foinicos neon ernos aner comenon enoesa hosta o toscae keino idon et ete peatumo dein epeu potoion aneluthen ector gaies hos segunae hagamai tetete pa te de dia dainos gunon apsas tae kalle ponde me pentos ikane. I saw one such sight at Delos beside the altar of Apollo, a young palm tree sapling shooting up. In the same way that I marveled for a long time in my heart when I saw that, since such a shoot had never shot up from the earth, so, my lady, I wonder and marvel at you, and am terribly afraid to clasp your knees. Hard sorrow comes upon me. And that's from Book 6, uh, lines 162 to 169. Odysseus then continues, describing to the girl what great toils the gods had forced him to endure. Here we have a classic Eliadian boundary situation, wherein the seemingly divine nature of the girl elicits a moment of personal reflection and a subsequent revelation. Our hero likens the godliness of Nausicaa to a young palm tree which he had seen next to an altar at Delos. At first, this might seem strange to us, but it's not so peculiar when we consider how the Greeks conceived of the temple of Apollo on Delos. For centuries, Delos served as the mythical center of the Greek world, as it was thought to be an island on which was held the world navel, or the omphalos. The tree growing right next to the altar on Delos, therefore, was an explicit center, uh, a world tree which Odysseus clearly recalls at the sight of godlike Nausicaa. At that moment, 
the immediate space around Nausicaa herself, because she's believed to be a goddess, becomes sacred space. And this event will set the tone for the remainder of the episode among the utopian Phaeacians. Here, it's as if all hierophany or experience of the divine participates in one archetypal experience outside of time and space, which is so strange to its recipient that it can only be conveyed by metaphor, by recalling other examples of that experience. The sacred tree, the pillar, the navel, or the world mountain, which stands outside of time, it serves as a physical point of reference in space upon which all revelatory experiences can be anchored. And it was, therefore, the dominant symbol for sacred space in the ancient Mediterranean. The experience of one center, such as the godlike Nausicaa, is bound up with the experience of every other center, such as the tree on Delos. One can thus interpret the journey of Odysseus as a journey from one sacred space to another on a quest to find his very own sacred space back home on Ithaca. Odysseus must inevitably face trials as he journeys through chaos of profane spaces between. Not long after this scene on the beach, Nausicaa makes plans for Odysseus to enter the Phaeacian town and be drawn into the orbit of a new center. And these will be the pillars of Alcinous' palaces. So from this point in the narrative onward, the new center will become one of two dominant centers in the narrative. The central pillars in the palace of Alcinous, as we'll see, become a sacred space counterpoint to the space around the pillars and the pillar-like olive tree of Odysseus's palace on Ithaca. Once Odysseus has convinced Nausicaa to take him to her father's house as a guest, she gives him instructions on how to find her parents, who might be able to secure him safe passage back home. Throughout her directions, Nausicaa gives a beautifully flowing and geographically oriented description of the Phaeacian city with its walls and towers and shipyards and temples and sacred groves and blooming orchards. Odysseus is given instructions to travel through all of these landmarks, then wait a while before coming to the palace of Alcinous, where, passing through the courtyards, he's to look for Nausicaa's mother with her handmaidens, leaning against a pillar, Kioni Keklimene. Uh, this is apparently, quote, a wonder to behold. Next to this very same pillar, says Nausicaa, is the king Alcinous on his throne where he sits and drinks wine just as a deathless god. Given how the pillar is embedded in this speech at the very center of the Phaeacian world, that is, in a place so spatially central that it stands between Phaeacia's king and queen, it becomes clear that this object bears more symbolic importance than a cursory reading might suggest. This pillar becomes the focal point of the Phaeacian episode. It is a symbol of the royal family's godlike nature, but also a symbol of Odysseus's longing for a return to his own world, to the pillars of his own halls. Earlier in the narrative, back on Ithaca, Penelope is described in similar language. And I quote, Klimakadupselen katebe sato hoyo domoyo ukoye amate ge kaigamfi poloi due ponto. He dote dem nesterasa fike to di agunaikon stera para stath monte geos puka poie toyo. Anta pareaon skomene lip. 
para cre demna amphipolos dara hoi ke dein ekaterte pareste. So now in translation, Penelope uh, implied descended her home's high staircase, not alone, but two handmaids followed with her. When the godlike woman reached the suitors, she stood beside a column of the densely built roof, holding a shiny veil against her cheeks, and a devoted handmaid stood on either side. That's from Book 1, lines 330 to 335. Standing beside the Ithacan pillar, Penelope, grieving midst the joy of feasting suitors, is here counterbalanced by the grieving of Odysseus amid the joy of Alcinous' halls. Penelope is here described as godlike beneath the pillar, just as Alcinous sitting beside his own is described like a deathless god, Athanatos Hos. Once Alcinous and Odysseus meet, and the king promises he will guarantee Odysseus' return, the bard Demodocus is called out and bid to sit and perform beneath a great pillar standing in the midst of a now feasting royal court. Mezo daitumonon proskiona macron. Demodocus' song, concerning the quarrel between Odysseus and Achilles at Troy, moves Odysseus to tears in self-examination. Here, yet another Eliadian boundary situation has emerged, that is, one of these moments of self-revelation, which is an expression of power characteristic of sacred space. Phaeacia is a sacred space in the purely Iliadian sense. It's ordered, it's set apart, and it's safe, and it's free from the chaos and unpredictability of the sea. It's even a land where gods are known to come down undisguised and feast with men. This space is, however, not Odysseus's own sacred space, and the situation prompts a sad revelation in Odysseus as he's racked by memories of home. This scene is paralleled with the aforementioned scene on Ithaca, where Penelope stood beneath a pillar, Stera Parastathmon, moved to tears by the bard Phemius's song, which floods her with thoughts of her husband's absence and a realization that her own sacred space was incomplete and violated. It is ultimately the pillar, the bard, and the realization of separation which links these scenes together. Once the games have passed and the Phaeacians have prepared to send Odysseus home, we have a farewell scene between Odysseus and Nausicaa which takes place beneath a pillar. Odysseus has just emerged from a hot bath uh, arguably a form of ritual evolution, which he's been sitting in and reflecting on his time on the island of Calypso, uh, at the Omphalos of the world, uh, where he was treated like a god. Immediately afterwards, Nausicaa, with godlike beauty, Homer tells us, stands beside a column of the densely made roof, and reminds Odysseus that he owes her his life. Odysseus replies to this, Nausicaa tu katarmeka le toro salkino oio utos non zeus te ye erigdu pos posise res oikade tel themen aikai nostimon e mari destai to kento kai ke ti te ohos eu keto oimen aie mata panta sugar me biosa o cure. Nausicaa, great hearted Alcinous's daughter, would that Hera's loud thundering husband Zeus now make it so that I go home to see my homecoming day. I pray to you, then, even there as to a goddess, always 
every day for you, my girl, have saved me. That's from book 8, line 464 to 468. The ambiguity of the first scene regarding whether or not Nausicaa is a goddess, with its digression to the palm tree at Delos, is retained in this farewell speech. Here, Odysseus makes a vow to the gods, a religious act not to be taken lightly, promising that upon his safe return home, that is, upon arrival to his own sacred space, he will not only remember, but pray to the girl as if she were a goddess. Now, Sika'a becomes a symbol of his safety, a symbol of his reintegration with sacred space after having been lost amidst the profane world. As Odysseus bids goodbye to the girl next to the pillar, he bids goodbye to the Phaeacian palace and, by extension, to all the lands it governs. On the sea again, Odysseus enters another liminal phase and doesn't find himself in another sacred space again until the end of the poem. It should be added that the departure of Odysseus also marks the end of the Phaeacian Utopia, an episode which attests to the highly personalized and subjective nature of sacred space and its proneness to the ravages of the profane world once its boundaries are not well maintained. The gods grow angry when the sacred qualities of the Phaeacian Utopia spill out into the profane world in the form of escorts on magical ships for strangers lost at sea. The porous boundaries of sacred space reveal their tenuous nature as the Phaeacians send ships away from their island, that is, when they send pieces of sacred space outside of their divinely sanctioned boundaries. With both Odysseus carrying in the chaos of the profane world to Alcinous's hall in the form of Poseidon's wrath, and with Alcinous reflexively granting safe passage to any and all, that is, exporting sacredness, we see that it's ultimately the poor management of boundaries in the eyes of the gods which is responsible for the mountain eventually brought down upon Scaria and the disaster which snuffs out all of the Phaeacian sacred space. By its very nature, sacred space may only retain its sacred character in so far as it's set apart from the wider world. When it's open and available for all to partake in, it loses its sacredness, its set apartness, and so it gets diluted or swallowed up by a more prevalent profane world. In light of this, uh, upon reaching Ithaca, Odysseus's struggle will be one of re-establishing boundaries and of expurgating his own sacred space from the profane world which had spilled in through his twenty years of involuntary absence and powerlessness to maintain his own boundaries. Once Odysseus has finally made his way to Ithaca and disguised himself to avoid the notice of the suitors, he finds Telemachus straight away, and together they very carefully plot how they will re-establish their once sacred space. As the two prepare weapons for their surprise attack on the suitors in the main hall of the palace, Telemachus is all of a sudden overwhelmed with the numinous character in the room. He turns to Odysseus, and he says, O pater he mega tod opthal moi sin oromai, empes moi toi koi megaron kalai de mesdomai, e latinai te do koi kai kiones hypsos e contes, fainon topthal mois hos e puros aitomenoio. He malatiste osendon hoi huranone runecusi. Father, yes, it's a great wonder, this thing I see with my eyes. Certainly to me the palace walls and the beautiful bases, the fir beams and the columns that hold things up high, appear to my eyes as if of blazing fire. 
some gods inside, quite surely, one of those who rule wide heaven. That's from Book 19, lines 36 to 40. In this scene, the walls themselves come alive, and the pillars, the kiones, explicitly exude a sacred quality. This scene is what Eliade would have called an elementary hierophany, uh, the full expression of a sacred space. It's unusual that Telemachus should be held on in such awe among the pillars of a palace which he has lived in since birth. The fact that Odysseus has returned means that to Telemachus the sacral quality of the space has been restored. Order has been re-established in Ithaca's halls, and so sacred space is re-established. Odysseus, however, quickly rebukes Telemachus. He says, Be silent and hold your mind in check. Don't ask questions. This is indeed the way of the gods who hold Olympus. So, Odysseus does not deny his son's hierophany. He even affirms his son's notion that the pillars have a divine quality, but he insists that they remain focused on their plot to kill the suitors. It's worth noting that Telemachus experiences no such hierophany or revelation in Book 4 while visiting the palaces of Menelaus, great as they are. The palace far off from his homeland, far away from sacred space, uh, and although filled with the gleaming of precious metals, luxurious baths, and lively feast halls, there's not one description of a pillar, uh, as one might expect from traditional descriptions of Mycenaean-styled Megara. Uh, throughout the Odyssey, the pillar motif is set aside and reserved as a boundary marker for sacred space, not merely pleasant, royal, or festive space. In order for sacred space to be restored in Ithaca from Odysseus's perspective, his palace must be expiated by the deaths of wasteful suitors and treacherous servants. The chaos which the suitors had unleashed on Odysseus's home had in turn to be met with chaos before the sacred nature of his home, that is, the extent to which it is set apart from the profane world, which the suitors themselves carried in, might be restored. It's of no coincidence that the word kion appears twice in Book 22 as the very instrument of torture and execution for the disloyal swineherd Melanthius and the twelve treasonous maidservants. The maidservants are hung from a pillar like birds in a snare, and Melanthius is taken down from a pillar before he's castrated and mutilated in the face. In this scenario, the pillar becomes as much an object of divine retribution as it acts in other times as an object of divine revelation. These characters had to be sacrificed, and holes had to be scrubbed, scrubbed clean and ritually suffumigated in order for the expiation of the palace and the restoration of sacred space could take place. It's at this moment at last, after Odysseus and Telemachus had taken all the precautions to rid the house of pollution, that Eurycleia bids Penelope to go down and see her long-lost husband. At first, Penelope refuses to believe that her husband had returned, imagining some god had come instead to rid her of all the suitors. So she goes down to the palace's main halls, wherein Odysseus is standing in the light of a fire. Penelope sits opposite to her husband, and Odysseus sits down against a great pillar. Here, Penelope waits in silence until she's chided by Telemachus, urging her on to say something to her husband, who's still dressed in rags and drenched in the gore of all the men he'd just slain. Just as Odysseus was unsure as to whether he should throw himself on Nausicaa at their first encounter in Phaeacia, Penelope is unsure, quote, whether to question her dear husband at a distance or to stand beside him, kiss his head, and take his hands, fearing that he might be a god. The center, indicated by the pillar, 
serves again as the archetypal locus of recognition or of revelation of truth. Here, Odysseus and Penelope settle on a test of sorts by which it might be proven that Odysseus is in fact who he appears to be. Penelope tells Telemachus, quote, We have signs concealed from others, ones that just the two of us know. Everyone bathes, uh, again, arguably a form of ritual ablution, and gets changed to prepare for a wedding of sorts. And Penelope decides on which sign she might use to test her husband. Once Odysseus gets out of his bath, Penelope calls for Eurycleia to, quote, spread a strongly built bed for him, the one Odysseus made himself outside the well-built chamber. End quote. Odysseus catches wind of this request and angrily replies to Penelope, and I'll give a long quotation here. Uh, I'm not going to give the Greek just because it's too long. No man alive, no mortal, not even fully in his prime, could easily move it, the bed, since a great sign is built into the artful bed. I and no one else built it. A long-leaved shrub of an olive tree grew inside the wall, luxuriantly flourishing. It was thick as a pillar. I threw a chamber round it and built it until I finished it with a close set stone and I roofed it over well. Then I added closely joined doors that fit tightly together. Then after that, I cut away all the foliage on the long-leaved olive tree. I trimmed the trunk from the roots, I smoothed it all out with bronze, expertly and well. I made it straight into a line and fashioned a bedpost. Then I bored it all with an auger. Starting from this, I carved out a bed until I finished it, inlaying it with gold and silver and ivory. I stretched a strap of oxhide shiny with purple in it. In this way, I declare this sign to you, but I don't know whether my bed is still intact, woman, or some man's already put it elsewhere, cutting under the bottom of the olive tree. To this response, Penelope collapses, having fully realized that the man before her is not a god in disguise, but in fact her husband. This symbol, the Sema, which stood at the center of their marriage, at the center of their world, was a post, an ermis, carved out of an olive tree as thick as a pillar. At last, Odysseus is restored to his own halls, to his own sacred space, surrounded by his own pillars, those which he told Telemachus hold up the sky as do the gods away from the chaos and uncertainty of the profane world. Even the mere idea of a pillar here acts as a conduit for epiphany. It's this very signpost around which Odysseus once constructed his entire palace, the omphalos of a world from which the plots of gods and men had threatened to divorce him. Through discourse with Penelope about the bedpost, Odysseus reestablishes his personal connection to the very construction of the bedchamber he had been seeking for over 20 years, and solidifies his identity as its rightful warden. So, in conclusion, we've seen how the Iliadian model of sacred space with its center based on the presence of an archetypal axis mundi, uh, a vertically aligned tree, post, or pillar, works aptly within the Odyssey. We've seen how these symbolic objects set the scene for boundary situations, that is, when characters become acutely aware of their place vis-a-vis -vis sacred and profane space, and subsequently have an epiphany or revelation. It's as if these pillars, posts, and trees take on a numinous aura and imbue those standing or sitting beneath them, enlightening everyone around the sacred spaces they delineate. 
the world axes play an additional role of contrasting the centers of two predominant worlds in the Odyssey, the bittersweet utopian land of the Phaeacians and the much sought after ruins of Ithaca. Odysseus's homecoming is only fully actualized once he's left the sacred space of Phaeacia, which is not his own, and returned to his own palace, his own sacred space, to lay down with Penelope beneath the axis of his own world. Thank you.